The origins and language of the mysterious Etruscans are subjects of debate for scholars today, perhaps because there seems to be no lineage. The negligible remains of the people of Etruria have nothing to do with the pyramids, temples, or other vestiges of ancient Egypt, and it's impossible to make a comparison with the Greeks, who left us with incomparable works of art like the Parthenon. And the Romans, they came later. But though the origins of the Etruscans are unknown, we have discovered a lot about Etruscan culture, from findings and archaeological digs in the Tuscany countryside. In the 6th century BC, Rome was still far from being the great capital of the world. In reality, during that time, the city was under the dominion and influence of the Etruscans. In fact, several kings of Rome were of Etruscan origin. While ruling Rome, the Etruscans built the architecturally accomplished Cloaca Maxima, a huge drain that conveyed sewage from quarters near the Roman Forum into the Tiber River. The influence of the Etruscans reached as far as Pompeii, and their fleets threatened Greek and Phoenician settlements on Sardinia and Corsica and on the Côte d'Azur. Still, everyone wanted to trade with the Etruscans because they were rich. They loved beautiful things and bought jewels, weapons, exotic objects, and pottery. One of the repositories for Etruscan culture is an ancient town called Merlo on the banks of the Umbroni River in the Siena province of Italy, the middle of the Etruscan nation. Nothing remains of the ancient town, but on a plateau called Poggio Civitate, just outside the city, are clues to what Etruscan homes were like. Though these cities were destroyed and rebuilt by Roman invaders, evidence of the Etruscan civilization has turned up in tombs and necropolises, cemeteries. In 1965, Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania sponsored an excavation led by archaeologist Kyle Meredith Phillips, Jr. at a site not far from the medieval town of Merlo. Since then, every summer, teams of American students and professional archaeologists have been working at Poggio Civitate. This archaeological campaign has unearthed a find of a huge Etruscan building from the distant past. The remains of the south wall are still in the clearing where the building was erected. The construction covered a square surface that was truly enormous, 197 feet on each side. Inside what must have been the courtyard, there are foundation walls of a so-called tempieto, or little temple, a small square-shaped building that in all likelihood contained statues of divinities and ancestors. Though little of the original building remains, it was natural for archaeologists to try to reconstruct what the building at Merlo looked like. More than 2,500 years ago, the little temple was in the middle of a big colonnaded courtyard that ran along three sides of the building. The building itself, which archaeologists called the Upper Building, was erected in 580 BC on the ruins of a previous so-called Lower Building erected in the 7th century BC a building that was later destroyed by fire. Archaeologists still don't know if it was the home of an important family or the meeting place of a league formed by various Etruscan cities. They found many terracotta statues on the roof, some of which had a peculiar headdress with a wide brim. The statues are called acroterii, a Greek word that indicates their position on the roofs of temples and buildings. They also unearthed ivory statuettes and precious stones that prove how wealthy the inhabitants of the building were. All the findings from the building at Poggio Civitate are now on view at the Merlot Museum set up in a home of the ancient medieval town. One striking figure is this horseman, it was on the roof of the lower building. Most of the objects in the museum collection come from this building.
Part of the roof of the more recent building was reconstructed, and some of the acroterii that used to decorate it were repositioned on top. Standing out is a statue of a man with a strange hat, something a musketeer or cowboy might wear. This statue has become the symbol of Merlo. These terracotta plates show aspects of everyday life. This one depicts a banquet. At the time, the plates were decorated very colorfully. The upper-class Etruscans loved the pleasures of life. Banquets were held in elegant settings among damask cushions, candlesticks, and expensive tableware, with waiters serving and musicians livening up the atmosphere. Frescoes found in tombs at Tarquinia, a city in the north of Latium, provide us with more detailed information on the daily life of the Etruscans. Frescoes in the Tomb of the Leopards, built in the middle of the 5th century BC, also depict a banquet scene, with musicians playing and slaves working as waiters. There is a couple on every bed. Because of these frescoes, we now know that unlike Greek and Roman women, most Etruscan women used to lie beside their mates, happy to take an active part in festive banquets. This freedom was unique in the ancient world and used to shock Greek and Roman travelers at that time. Greek historian Theopompus of Chios, who was thought to have the most malicious tongue of ancient literature, wrote in the fourth century BC, Etruscan women don't feast only with their husbands, they feast with anybody. They don't mind appearing nude in public and gladly do exercises at the gym beside men. Plus, they eat and drink a lot and are really good looking. This was a privileged position compared to women of other civilizations of the ancient world. The nearly equal relationship with their husbands made women feel self-confident and proud and naturally, a woman like that loved to dress well and adorn herself with magnificent jewels. Over 3,000 Etruscan bronze mirrors still exist today. There are inscriptions on the back of the mirrors proving that, in a period of widespread illiteracy, Etruscan women knew how to read and write. The area around Merlot has become famous not only for the excavations, but also for important research in the field of genetics. One of the mysteries that has engrossed historians and scholars is the disappearance of the Etruscan civilization in a short span of two centuries. We know that it was assimilated by the Romans, the new rulers of the world. The question was, were there any descendants of the Etruscans that survived the centuries? Researchers have concluded that the inhabitants of Merlot are the direct descendants of the Etruscans. The Italian Council for Scientific Research had conducted a study on the genetic heritage of Italians. It was noted that there are three genetically different areas in Italy, which correspond to precise geographic locations. The most homogeneous of these areas, the one with the highest concentration of a certain genetic type, is the area of Tuscany, the ancient homeland of the Etruscans, particularly the area around the town of Merlo. Genetics researchers, now working with modern DNA or genetic code techniques, are anxiously exploring whether the DNA of the inhabitants of this beautiful town corresponds to that of the otherwise extinct Etruscan people. Besides Merlo, another important commercial area of Etruria is a place called Volterra, one of the most ancient cities of Italy. Volterra's name has not changed much in almost 3,000 years. Back then it was called Velathri. Like many Etruscan towns, it occupied an easy to defend, naturally strong position on a hilltop which dominated the valleys of the Era, Elsa, and Cicinia rivers. Volterra was a flourishing town whose inhabitants lived off their craftsmanship. They became famous for their work with alabaster, a type of soft rock that is easy to carve and is plentiful there. 
Though there were many types of alabaster works, it was the urns that were exported to most of Italy. Modern carving of alabaster, which prospered anew in the area at the end of the 18th century, forms a perfect link between Etruscan workers and modern craftsmen. During the 4th century, a wall that was over four miles long and covered an area of nearly 290 acres surrounded the city. Although the wall was rebuilt many times during the Roman and medieval periods, there are still large sections from the Etruscan period. One would enter the town through solidly built gates, like the Diana Gate, or through the monumental Arch Gate, the lower part of which dates from the Etruscans. The Romans rebuilt the arch using Etruscan material, like the three human heads that are practically unrecognizable today. But the most substantial traces of Etruscan Volterra are found in the zone of the Acropolis, where the park of the castle is today. The area contains many archaeological ruins, mostly building foundations, situated along an ancient road network of the city. Two temples used to stand in this area, built around the 3rd century BC. The purpose of the small building, shown in close-up, is another mystery scholars have not yet managed to unravel. Heading now toward the coast, we come to another city that became famous for a totally different kind of work. It is Populonia, or Pupluna, its ancient name. Populonia is the only big Etruscan town that was built directly on the coast. It was here that Etruscans produced, processed, and traded large quantities of iron. Over the centuries, they accumulated enormous piles of slag from the work of the furnaces. Some piles were 10 to 20 feet high. These slag piles were so rich in iron, even in the unprocessed state, that in 1940 the Italian army used them to make war supplies. Scholars have estimated that there could have been 2 million tons of slag in these piles. The present town of Populonia traces its origin to more recent times. The town flourished in the latter part of the Middle Ages. But iron was being refined and traded here at Populonia nearly 500 years before Christ. Where did this precious metal come from? In spite of metal-bearing chains nearby, the iron came by sea from the island of Elba. The inhabitants of Populonia were able to transport the metal and protect it from the many Phoenician and Greek pirates and rivaling Etruscan cities thanks to a powerful fleet. The citizens grew rich in a short span of time, owing to the iron trade. Merchants used to buy the raw material at Populonia and then have skilled craftsmen make weapons and pieces of armor for their leaders and warriors. The material piled up for centuries, and much of it ended up being buried in necropolises. It wasn't until the late 1900s that cemeteries buried for years and years, like the one at San Cerboni, were discovered. Here there are important examples of chamber or tumulus tombs. These tombs have a long access corridor that leads to a quadrangular cella. The diameter of the cylindrical tambour that covered it could be as long as 90 feet. Mighty walls defended the upper part of the city, or Acropolis, where sanctuaries and other public buildings were erected. At the time when Populonia was at the zenith of its splendor, the city walls looked like this. In the background, the outlines of the buildings on the Acropolis are silhouetted on the horizon. The iron that left Populonia would be distributed to cities throughout the Etruscan Empire, all the way to Kisri, known in Roman times as Seire, present-day Cerveteri. 
Cerveteri was one of the most powerful cities in South Etruria, as is proven by the wealth found in its splendid tombs. One fine example is the sepulcher at the tomb of the bas-reliefs in the necropolis at Banditaccia. It got this name from the fact that on its walls there are reproductions of objects used in everyday life. These include a lantern or oil lamp, some cord, a wine jug, as well as some utensils and weapons. But the town considered the most important city in the area was Clusium, or Cusi, one of the few cities of the ancient world that dared to defy Rome and won, at least in the early stages. Rome was only a frontier town at the peak of Etruscan splendor. Indeed, one could say it was the Etruscans who brought grandeur and a civilized way of life to Rome and to a country that, on the whole, was rather savage at the time. Etruscan kings ruled Rome for over a hundred years. Some say it was their arrogance that spelled the end of Etruscan power. Roman historians documented the war between Rome and Clusium. According to texts, it started in 510 BC when the son of Tarquinius Superbus, a Roman king of Etruscan origin, ravished a beautiful and virtuous matron. The Roman nobles rebelled and expelled the Tarquins from their city, vowing that never again would a king rule Rome. And thus was born the glorious Roman Republic. After being ousted from Rome, Tarquinius Superbus went to Clusium and sought the help of its great king, Porcina, who headed a confederation of Etruscan cities. Porcina marched on Rome in 508 BC, winning many victories before being turned back by Horatius at the banks of the Tiber River. The figure of Porcina is shrouded in legend and mystery, like the grave where he is thought to be buried. Scientists and adventurers have been searching for years in the countryside around Clusium for the mythical mausoleum where the body of Porcina was laid to rest with fabulous treasures 2,500 years ago. However, despite the many attempts, the tomb has never been found. Pliny the Elder mentions Porcina's tomb in a text. After hearing the many stories that were being told during his lifetime, he imagined it as a grand, square-shaped construction measuring 300 feet on each side that was several stories high and supported by very high pyramids. Inside the square base, there must have been a labyrinth of tunnels where the treasures were hidden. It's possible that Pliny got carried away with his description because it's hard to believe that a monument of this size has vanished completely. Another secret about Etruscan civilization that has only been partly unveiled concerns the language. This is the alphabet reproduced on a very particular primer shaped like a cockerel. Quite a few scholars believe that Etruscan is a very ancient language that may even have existed before Greek and Latin. The problem in figuring out the language of the Etruscans stems from the mystery over their origins. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC, the Etruscans were originally from Lydia, an ancient region in present-day Turkey, and sailed to the Italian coast from there. But according to another theory by the Greek historian Dionysius of Halicarnassus, on which many modern scholars agree, the Etruscans were an indigenous people who came from a territory that includes present-day Tuscany, part of Latium and Emilia. The most antique evidence dates from the 10th to the 7th centuries BC and is found in a zone that we rarely think about as having connections with the Etruscans. This place is Felsina, or present-day Bologna. Artifacts from Villanova are housed in Bologna at the Civic Archaeological Museum, which was opened in 1881. It is a unique collection, the only one of its kind in the world. In the 9th century BC, it was here that the so-called Villanovan culture flourished, named after Villanova, a town near Bologna, where archaeologists discovered a group of tombs attributed to this culture. 
Many scholars believe the inhabitants of Villanova may have been the ancestors of the Etruscans. In these tombs, the deceased were cremated and the ashes kept in ossuaries or urns, by conical shaped vases covered with an upturned bowl. This specimen dates from the 9th century BC. The urn was put in a hole in the ground lined with pebbles. Sometimes the earth was kept back by stone slabs. Personal items were also put into the tomb, either directly in the ossuary or beside it. Items like fibulae, used more as ornaments than to fasten garments. There might have been a sharpened razor in bronze. The presence of razors in almost all men's graves leads us to believe that unlike the Greeks, Etruscan men preferred to have clean-shaven faces. An axe blade, also in bronze, used both as an implement and as a weapon, would also have been included. In women's graves, they also found fibulae, often decorated with swastikas or of the twisted arch type. But there would also be humble objects, like whorls, which were weights put at the end of the spindle, and naturally, thread spools. Also included would be armolas, bronze bracelets, and some pearls and amber pendants that were perhaps tied to each other to make a necklace. D. H. Lawrence said that to the Etruscan, all was alive. Indeed, from frescoes found in tombs, it is evident that the Etruscans were an active people. They loved public spectacles, performances in the square, and athletic competitions. They loved to go hunting and fishing, but also appreciated music and big banquets. The stature they gave women made them unique among ancient civilizations. But after they were driven from Rome, the Etruscans never regained prominence. By 280 BC, all Etruscan cities had either surrendered or died under Rome's sword. In a land they had enriched, now only their tombs survive. And nearly all that we know about their way of life comes from their way of death. Mysteries about the land of Etruria can now only be solved from secrets buried in the depths of the earth.